Okay, so we are starting general session two. And this general session is called Unlocking the Dark Data Behind Your Driver Recruitment Marketing. You guys are really in for a treat. Our next speaker, Christopher S. Penn, is an authority on analytics, digital marketing, and marketing technology. He is a recognized thought leader, a best-selling author, and keynote speaker. He has shaped four key fields in the marketing industry. Google Analytics adoption, data-driven marketing, modern email marketing, and artificial intelligence machine learning in marketing. Mr. Penn is a 2019 IBM champion in IBM Business Analytics, co-founder of the groundbreaking PodCamp Conference, and co-host of the Marketing Over Coffee Marketing Podcast. This is really the interesting part about Chris's talk for us today. Over the past several months, he has also become an expert on driver recruiting data. He has been working with the digital media team at Conversion Interactive Agency to dive into our data in hopes of providing us with some insight into how we can help our clients better recruit and retain drivers. He and his team have mined our data. They have dissected conversations with drivers. They have evaluated content and top terms that drivers search. They have analyzed trucking forums where drivers are active, and much, much more. I think you will find his insight, his perspective, and the results of the data he uncovered extremely interesting and valuable. Please welcome Christopher Penn. Good morning, thank you very much. Please give a hand to uh, Conversion Interactive Agency for this amazing event. The number one question asked in these presentations is, really, can I get a copy of the slides? Where can I get the slides? You can get the slides at wherecanigettheslides.com. <laughs> Not kidding. As marketers, we are being asked for three things by our stakeholders. We are being asked for our marketing to get better, faster, and cheaper. How are we doing at this? Let's take a look at better and the challenges you are facing in recruitment and retention marketing. This year, 2019, we as a civilization will create about 40 exabytes of data. That is an unimaginably large number. So unimaginably large, you're probably saying, what in the world is an exabyte? How many of you have watched a show on Netflix? Has anyone not watched a show on Netflix? OK. <laughs> Go away. If you were to, uh, to leave here, if you were to start binge watching on Netflix and not stop to eat, sleep, use the restroom, anything, uh, and you started 55 million years ago, today you would just get to one exabyte of data, and we're creating 40 of these this year. That's how much data that we are being confronted with as marketers. We are not able to get a hold of, uh, get our arms around this much data being created, and in the next five years, this is going to quintuple. Because all these lovely devices that we're all wearing, all the sensors, all the Internet of Things, they're called, are just adding to the pile. Every new vehicle that's produced these days has a billion and a half sensors, not literally, but many, many sensors from things like tire pressure, fuel efficiency, you name it, all that is contributing to the amount of data we have to contend with. We also have a data quality problem. How many of you have this person in your recruiting system? Test at test.com. So we have got more data, and it's harder to figure out what's good and what's not good. So we're not really doing such a hot job at better. The result of this is that when chief marketing officers are asked, what percentage of the time do you use analytics in your decision making, they gave us a rousing one third. One third of the time, they're using data to make decisions. What the heck are you doing the other two thirds of the time? You're like, guessing? Actually, yes, and a lot of the time. People will call it experience or instinct or guts, but it, it's guessing. When you guess without data, you tend, as John Acuff mentioned, you tend to, to make questionable decisions. So we're not really doing well better. How are we doing it faster? Are we, as marketers, getting faster? In 2017, in 60 seconds on the internet, this is what happened. We had 
1.8 million snaps, 70,000 hours of Netflix watch in just 60 seconds, 16 million text messages. In 2018, last year, 18 million text messages. We have 266,000 hours of Netflix watch every second. 990,000 swipes on Tinder in 2017, 2018, 1.1 million swipes. Not really sure if it's left or right. I'm going to guess mostly left. Those of you who laugh, we know what age you are. <laughs> but the point is, when we're confronted with this much data coming at us this quickly, and in this many different formats, it's getting harder and harder to keep up. This is just the news. We have transport topics out in the hall as one of the many, many publications that are in the world. This year, 2019, we are on track for 122 million news stories in the year. If you get a front page placement in Transport Topics or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times about what a great place you are to work or what a, an amazing company culture you have, you are one of 172 stories per minute. Right? So the amount of time that you have visibility to your audience is diminishing smaller and smaller and smaller every single year. So we're not doing such a hot job with Faster. How about cheaper? Is marketing getting cheaper? Are you being more efficient with the dollars you've been given? Nope. In every category except product introduction spending, chief marketing officers across all industries expect to be spending more on CRM, on brand, on services. About the only thing they're not spending more on is new product introduction. So we're not doing so hot, such a hot job at making marketing more efficient, more effective. In other words, we're kind of failing as marketers. What's the solution? How do we get around this? If we're not doing a good job as humans, maybe the, we need to have more than humans on our team. Maybe we need to have some machines to help us out. That's what we're going to talk about today, is how you can use machines to get more insight into the heads of your drivers, into the heads of your recruiters, to understand and, and get better results out of your marketing. Artificial intelligence. How many people have heard the term artificial intelligence or machine learning? OK, good. Delivers three basic benefits. Better, faster, cheaper, right? It is much faster. Machines can process at speeds that are astonishingly fast, especially with today's modern cloud computing. Machines are more accurate. If you've ever copied and pasted something incorrectly, you know exactly how many mistakes can seep into the process. Now, when you're looking at what a recruiter, for example, is typing into a CRM, there's an awful lot of margin for error, particularly if the recruiter is new uh, or it's, they've not been on a super long shift in your call center. Whatever the case may be, the machines can do a better job, in general, of moving data from one point to another. And artificial, I'll get that, uh, artificial intelligence is all about automation, about taking tasks, not jobs, but tasks away from us that we don't want to do anymore. How many of you have at least one task in your workflow every day that you don't look forward to and is the same bloody thing every single day, whether it's timesheets, whether it's you know, expense reports, uh, whether it's a, a specific meeting. We all have that task that we don't enjoy doing. And the further down in the organization you go, the more of these there are. So the third benefit of artificial intelligence is being able to stop doing that stuff. I used to work at a, a public relations agency, and there was one poor soul, the, the lowest person on the food chain, whose job was to copy and paste from one spreadsheet to another. That was all they did, eight hours a day. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can take that work away from that person and give that person something else to do that actually uses their talents, as opposed to you know, how quickly you can hit three keys on a keyboard. What is this stuff? You've probably read a lot about it. You probably interact with artificial intelligence on a daily basis, especially if you have people like Siri or Alexa or Cortana or OK Google in your, in your smartphones or in your houses. What is this stuff? Artificial intelligence is the process of getting machines to simulate human intelligence tasks. Here's how humans develop, right? They start with basic inputs and being able to process those inputs. They eventually develop language, and then they have higher cognitive function. By the way, as a parent of a teenager, I appreciate the fact that cognitive function drops off when they hit their teens. We are trying to teach our machines to do the same things. If you can see me and distinguish me from the background, we're using vision. If you can hear the sound of my voice and it makes sense to you, it's not just a bunch of noise, you're using language processing. So we're trying to teach machines to do these exact same tasks. When we build these into machines, we start with things like algorithms and move into machine learning and then to deep learning and then to what will eventually be called general purpose AI, a machine that is sentient and alive. That is a long way away. 
most credible experts say 2050 or so, so we have, we have some time. All artificial intelligence is math. A lot of people think it's magic. It's not magic. AI is math. That's all it is. It begins in statistics and probabilities. Is this a picture of a Peterbilt or is this a picture of a Mac? Right? Probability, balance of probability. That's all the machines are doing. When you add statistical techniques together, you get what are called algorithms. And as a marketer, if you've done any kind of things like email marketing or web page A-B testing, you have used algorithms. They're just a repeatable set of processes designed to give us an outcome. A-B testing, multivariate testing, anything like that you have used or the agency that you use has used on your behalf. You use algorithms every single day. I was going to ask how many people got dressed this morning, but everyone did. How many people put the same general article of clothing on first? Some people put the bottom on first, some people put the top on first, a few weirdos put their socks on first, but you all generally have the same algorithms powering your day to day. You're using algorithms every day. Now what happens when you put a whole bunch of algorithms together and turn it into sort of a box that you can pour information into? That's software. Machine learning, which is a subset of AI, is when the machines start writing their own software. Traditionally, when you have an app on your mobile device, for example, it is the code and it spits out data, whether it's little like dancing candy crush characters in a game, whether it is uh, applications in your CRM, the software spits out the data. Machine learning is the opposite. We feed data to the machines, they learn from it, and then they can start to do things on their own. A couple of examples. Let's say you had a table of blocks. Right? What are the different ways we could work with this table of blocks? One branch of machine learning is called supervised learning. We tell a machine, hey, I want you to learn the color red. And we teach it over and over again. This is the color red, this is the color red, this is the color red. And eventually the machine can recognize it with all new data. Yep, there's red in this picture. Or no, there's not red in this picture. You'll see this example a lot happen when we're doing things like marketing lead scoring. Lead scoring is very little more than supervised learning. This lead is qualified, this lead is unqualified. The most famous example of this is IBM Watson's uh, oncology software. In 2016, I think it was. No, it was 20, 2013. Um, there was a woman in, at the University of Tokyo who was suffering from leukemia. Doctors could not figure out what was wrong with her. They were treating her, she was not getting better. So they brought in Watson and they sequenced this woman's genome and 233,000 journals of oncology and said, Watson, figure out what's wrong. Watson crunched all the data, spit out and said, you're treating the wrong kind of leukemia. You missed something along the way. Change the treatment to this. It was, you supervised learning to identify what was wrong. And she made a full recovery, which in itself is pretty cool that a machine helped save a human's life. But the fun part was that Watson did it all in 11 minutes. That's the power of supervised learning as part of machine learning. The second branch is called unsupervised, which is we know colors. What if we want to sort for other things? Maybe we want to sort these blocks by all the different colors. Maybe we want to sort them by different shapes or sizes. Whatever it is, we get a large amount of data and we need to classify it. We need to categorize it. When you're talking to drivers on the phone, they could say any number of things. I will talk about the 17,000 calls that we listen to. They do say all sorts of things. You need to be able to sort and cluster and, and arrange large amounts of data in order to get into a driver's head. It's no good asking five of them what's on their minds when there are 50,000, 500,000, 5 million that you're trying to, to reach. Simple example of, un, of unsupervised learning, taking 2,600 articles and turning it into one chart that we can bring to your CEO and say, hey, here's what all the news about our company has been in the last two weeks or three weeks or whatever. Machines can help us do this and get to our data much, much faster. The last stage, which is currently the, the hottest thing in, in AI right now, is called deep learning. And this is where you start putting all these layers together, like pancakes, if you will, and the data flows from layer to layer, and what you get are machines that are better, faster, and cheaper than us at very specific tasks. How many of you have tried the Google Translate either app or the, the web page? Okay, a decent number of you. It's a, it's, it's a really in, a nice tool for translating text. I'll get it. Google Translate was good up until about two years ago, and then it got substantially better because instead of trying to figure out that butterfly equals mariposa. Google fed all 103 human languages it had access to into Translate and said, you figure it out. 
We don't know how language works. You figure it out. And Google found a meta language underneath all of our human languages that it knows. So now when you go from English to Google to Dutch or Spanish to Google to Swahili, it's much, much better. For those of you who are biblical scholars, this is reverse engineering the Tower of Babel. I don't know if that's a good idea or bad. You will see this most in the next few years in autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are using what's called deep learning to figure out the task of driving because there are so many variables to driving that it's difficult to, to account and code for every single condition. But once you feed enough driving data to a truck, it will eventually figure out how to drive on its own. And probably better than we, we do because half of the people I see driving every morning are driving like this. So that's the layout of artificial intelligence. Now, why would you need to know this? You're probably saying to yourself, what, what good is this? I'm trying to recruit drivers. Every vendor you work with is going to be slapping the AI label on every piece of software in the next couple of years, if they're not already. Right? And so knowing this, at least knowing the basic ideas behind it, allows you to do a, a little uh, excremento de toro check on what those vendors have to say. Where does this fit into your data? There's a hierarchy of analytics originally created by Gartner and then improved over time. All of your data usage begins at that red layer, the descriptive stuff. What happened? What data do you even have? Do you know what happened? Do you know how many miles your drivers went yesterday? Do you know how happy they are? Do you know how many uh, rest areas or truck stops they stopped at? Do you have the data about what makes them happy and what doesn't? The chances are, by the way, that you do, but you just don't, you're just not able to get at it. 90% of the companies we work with are stuck here. This hierarchy gets more valuable the higher up you go. So if you're stuck here, you're not getting very much value out of your data. When you move up to the next layer, it's called diagnostic analytics. Why did something happen? Our applications to our recruiting page are down. Our, our form fills are down. Our phone calls are down. Why? Why did that happen? You have some of that data already, and for the rest, you have proven methods for doing that. You have focus groups. You have customer advisory boards, or you should. You have a, if you don't have a driver advisory board, you might want to get one. Uh, you have surveying. There are a number of vendors uh, all around the room here that help, can help you with diagnostic analytics. Why are people making the choices they're making, and why is, is our business functioning a certain way? The third rung in the ladder is predictive. What will happen next? Using statistics. Can we predict what will likely happen next? The answer is yes. Human beings individually are highly unpredictable. But as a group, we are extremely predictable. Right? Every single driver in your force wants to be home on the holidays. I can't think of, well, almost. I mean, this is probably so one really disgruntled guy who's like, I'd rather, no, nah, no. Nah. But for the most part, everybody want, almost everybody wants to be at home. Almost everybody wants better pay. When we, when we look at what people say, we can forecast ahead what they're likely to say because we are all predictable. Our fourth layer is prescriptive. Our software can start to tell us what to do. If we have the data, we know why it happened, we know what's going to happen next, we can figure out what to do. And finally, at the top of the hierarchy, where very few companies, Amazon, Facebook, Google, live, is machines are doing it for us. Again, this is important for you to know where you are on this hierarchy to understand how much work you need to do to make the most of your data. All the money happens up here. That's why Amazon is a multi-billion dollar company. All of the work is down here, but you can't skip steps. You have to start at the bottom. What can't AI do? AI is really bad at four things. It's bad at empathy. To what John was saying earlier, understanding, it can, it can help you analyze, but it can't tell you what to do, and it certainly can't do it for you. Right? You have to do that as the human. You are still important. AI has terrible, broad judgment. It can make narrow decisions, but it can't make exceptions. AI is, is, and software in general are bad at exceptions. When you look at the recruiting process, for example, and you see something that would be, is just on the line of disqualifying an application, you as a human can make a judgment call and say, you know what, we'll let it slide this time for this one mi relatively minor thing. Or you can say, you know what, on paper you're qualified, but I don't feel like it's a good fit. Machines can't do that, so we still need you. Machines have very bad, are very bad at understanding general life experience, and they're really bad at domain expertise. They have to be told what words and phrases and things are important. And for that matter, so do the people who, like me who are working with your data. We need your da domain expertise to understand what is important and what's not. And for the most part, 
AI is still not as good at relationships as we are humans. The exception is if your customer experience is so appallingly awful that a machine is better. For example, the Department of Motor Vehicles. Does anyone enjoy going there? No? OK, I didn't think so. The customer experience there is so bad, we would much rather have a machine work with us and just do our license renewal or whatever than be glared at and, 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 and bossed around. So if your customer experience is awful, AI could help. I would submit you probably have other business problems to fix first. But for the most part, people will still want to deal with people in the near future. So let's look at the applications of this technology with regard to what's in the heads of drivers. There are five problems that we want to look at. <clears throat> we want to tap the data that's untapped that you are sitting on right now. Every time you post something on Indeed.com or every time you read a post on truckersreport.com, you are looking at data. Are you using it? The chances are the answer is no. Do you know who to talk to? Do you know who is influential among your drivers? That's the unknowns. Our third problem that we have to solve often is what can, what, we have a lot of data points, which ones can help us make the most sense of what action to take next? The fourth one is that we're too unfocused because we've got too much data. We need to know what data should we even be looking at. And our fifth is because we're in reactive mode as marketers, scrambling from emergency to emergency like a terrible Tarzan, we can't plan ahead. In the untapped section, we looked at, with Conversion Interactive Health, 17,400 calls from their call center from last year. They gave us audio files, hundreds and hundreds of hours of audio files. By the way, <clears throat> for those of you who are using a call center, the longest calls we had, there were about 150, 200 calls are six and a half hours long. You know what they were? Hold music. Somebody sat on the phone for six and a half hours. They probably just put it on in their rig while they were driving, and it was literally just the same message. Your call is important to us. Please stay on the line, and someone will be with you shortly, six and a half hours later. So you have to please check with your vendors to make sure that you're dealing with that. And somebody else, one company, I don't know which company, I can't remember, has gospel radio as their hold music. Boy, did that make for an interesting transcript. We looked at 21,000 posts from Reddit, 10,000 posts from Facebook, 21,000 job listings from Indeed.com, and we looked at uh, 20,000 posts from Trucker's Report. To try and figure out what is it that we are, what kind of language we're using. Text mining and language is one of the most challenging problems to deal with because it's totally unstructured. Right? The words and phrases we say don't fit in neat little boxes like you see in surveys, you know, on a scale of one to five, how much do you hate your job? That's easy data to process. Language is a lot harder. So Indeed job boards, for example, when people post jobs, when you post jobs on Indeed, you're using the language that you care about. Right? This is your perspective. It's a, it, communications will be sender-centric communication. Hello? When people are on trucking forums and Reddit and Facebook groups, they're speaking in their language. And then we kind of meet in the middle with these recruiter calls. Ideally, ideally, what you say to a driver for recruiting purposes should be the same language that they talk about their own work. Right? The same things that are important to you should be important to them, and vice versa. And they should see that. What do we actually find? Not so much. On Indeed.com, the most important things people talk about are things like, are you, do you have a valid license? Do you have this, the appropriate permit? Do you have the appropriate CDL? Have you been free of accidents and things like that? All of the job listings are incredibly company-centric. Here's what we think, here's what we demand of you. Now, if I'm a driver and I'm reading that and saying, well, there's, there's, there's nothing in here for me. Right? All this is is your demands and nothing else. Why would I pay attention to, to this? You know, I, if I want to be bossed around, go back to grade school. So the language that we're using in, in, on job boards is very sender-centric, extremely sender-centric. When we look at the words that we talk with our candidates on phone calls, we do ask a lot of the same questions. And they default to, to conversations about pay. How many cents per mile? What's the starting rate? Signing bonuses, things like that. But other things creep in, like, will I be home on the weekends? And then once you start to go into the conversations that drivers have, it gets very different. Yes, things like CDLs and stuff still matter. Yes, pay does matter, but so does home time. So does salary. And this one that showed up more than anything else, people saying drivers seek jobs, not rates. 
They want to work for companies, not for miles on the road. But when we're putting out job ads, what are we advertising? How many cents per mile, right? Signing bonuses. Are you paying attention to the quality of life conversation points that drivers are talking with each other about? And we see this again on Facebook. We see this again on Reddit, not as much. But our language that we use to talk to drivers is a total mismatch, doesn't dine at the same table as what drivers talk about to each other. Now, you don't necessarily need artificial intelligence to figure this out, right? You can do this just by talking to the drivers and having you know, beers with them every now and again. But have you changed the language that you're using in all of your recruiting materials to reflect the stuff that they care about? And by the way, this is from Conversion Interactive's call center logs, right? You have your own data. You want to run this kind of analysis for yourself with your own interviews, with your own call center transcripts, with your own online job applications to figure out, is there something that your drivers specifically care about more than others, right? Because what's true for J.B. Hunt may not be true for Cardinal. What's true for Cardinal may not be true for Rail especially when you have carriers that specialize in regional areas. There may be some things that are more important to certain regions than others. So you need to run this analysis to understand how are you different from your audience. I was having a conversation this morning with uh, the folks at uh, American Driver Network asking how are you comparing your Facebook data? Because Facebook gives you data about your audience. Right? If you put a Facebook pixel on your job application page and you put a Facebook pixel on your website, have you compared the audiences? Are they the same people? They may not be. You may have people who are looking, but they decided they didn't want to talk to you, and so they vanished. You have access to a lot of this data already. Please don't forget post-hire. Post-hire data is some of your most valuable data because it tells you the second half of this conference, recruitment and retention. How many of you check your glass door re listings re on a routine, regular basis? Okay, that's not enough hands in this room. Everyone's hand should be up. If you manage a fleet, if you manage drivers and you're not checking Glassdoor, you are missing an opportunity to hear feedback from people either who applied for jobs with you or currently work for you or are no longer working for you and have really strong things to say. This is an analysis. Um, this is from the managers at a, one of the major carriers and what managers talk about most in their Glassdoor reviews. Right? The policies of which people are promoted, talent, uh, management being completely disconnected, that's the back office. When you go to just the drivers, bad pay, management gets paid more than we do, uh, we have the staff, we have dispatching issues. Are you mining the feedback you're getting? Do you, if you do exit interviews, are you mining those? If you are talking to people just before they quit, what kinds of things do they talk about after they're employed with you? Do the same analysis. Here's what we have on our job listings. Here's what we have in trucking forums. Here's what we have for people who already work for us and what they say. If there's a nice common thread between all three, you're reaching your audience and you're, you're talking the language they talk. If they're not, if they're totally disconnected, if what you say on job boards has nothing to do with what truckers say, has nothing to do with what people who work for you say, you have a major communications problem internally. And this data is available. You don't have to pay to go read Glassdoor. You just have to sign up for it. But you can read through. You probably don't have more than 1,000 or two listings. Uh, this, this company, I think, had about 10,000. So that was why we, we chose them. But we can find what people talk about and what they care about and make use of it. Second thing is influential people. Who talks about whom? We did this at the National Retail Federation show of uh, identifying who talks to whom. But guess what? You don't have to use social media data. In fact, social media data is not great for trucking. You are much better off looking, for example, at who references whom, who replies to whom on forums like Truckers Report. Right? Who has sway within your community? Who does everyone else talk about? Who does everyone else listen to? In your own companies, if you have any kind of internal employee communications, analyze those patterns, figure out who the actual influences are. It may not be the person who's the highest paid person in the room, 
but it may be the person that everybody else looks to for real answers. There's always that one person in the company, you know, the CEO gets up and says a whole bunch of things and there, there's words and, and charts. And then there's that middle manager or there's that senior staff member who's like, actually what's really gonna happen is this. But machine learning tools help us decode our networks of influence about how we talk to each other. What do we do when we have unclear data? How many of you are currently doing search engine marketing, search engine optimization, SEO on your websites to try and rank for keywords? Okay. How many of you feel confident that you're getting the most out of your organic search traffic? Well, all the hands went away. Oh, one person. Awesome. When you use machine learning techniques like clustering, for example, you can figure out of these two different metrics, like how hard, how much competition is there for a given term and how many people search for a term we want to be up here in the top left. How many of you are doing things like trying to compete for words like highest picking trucking jobs or trucking jobs near me, but are not focusing on truck driving jobs, which is a huge search, hugely searched thing, but nobody's really competing for that. Why? Because your software didn't tell you that this is actually what people search for the most. Not trucking jobs, truck driving jobs. Something as simple as that can change your marketing because instead of trying to decide in advance what people want, you listen to what people are already doing on Google or whatever and identify it and change your content, change your ads, change your emails to reflect that. The fourth thing we're challenged with is overload of data. For most people, reporting feels like this. Back the truck up, pour the data on the desk. Right? And then we're like, we're sitting in a mountain of data, we don't know what to do. Again, using machine learning technology, we can figure out out of all the things that people do to get to your website, to get to your job applications, to get to your forms, to get to your call center, what are the channels that matter the most? This is an example we did for a customer where they wanted to know what channels contributed the most to their conversions. And it's a process, the technique is called Markov chains. It's like digital Jenga where you just keep pulling out blocks until the tower falls down. If you keep pulling out the email block over and over again and the tower keeps falling down every time, email is the most important channel. For them, email mattered a lot, search mattered a lot. But what was interesting is for this company, they were spending a tremendous amount of, on, of money on Facebook. Facebook ads, Facebook promotions, Facebook Live. But for them, Twitter did better. So we're like, so maybe, a, adjust your strategy a little. Change up your mix. Now this is not a hard and fast rule. This is this company only. You have to do this analysis with your data, with the stuff that's in your Google Analytics to figure out what works best for you. Work with your agency partners to ask them, hey, can you do this kind of analysis for us so that we can figure out where to put our time, our money, and our efforts. And it's not just marketing data you can do this with. You can do this with any kind of structured data or even unstructured data. Going back to Glassdoor, we looked at truck driving reviews and we tagged each Glassdoor review by the topics they mentioned, like how much does the management work or value or communication or benefits or, or the role of a management or culture or pay. What matters? In most of the reviews that we were looking at for this one trucking company, pay was what People got, what got higher reviews, better scoring reviews for this company on Glassdoor. But culture was a, a distant second, but still second. The quality of the management doesn't matter to this company's employees. So being able to do this kind of analysis, same type of analysis, to say this is what matters to the people who already work for us. And finally, being able to forecast and predict is how you'll stop your marketing from feeling like an emergency every single day. When you look at how people behave, again, we as a society behave in percentages, right? We're very predictable. So we took a look at all this job related, uh, truck driving job related search terms and, set, and used machine learning to forecast forward when in the next year will searches be highest for all these terms. In Q1, it was around the beginning of February. In Q2, it's going to be, uh, there's be a spike towards the end of May, and again, a spike towards the end of June. Now, I do not work in trucking. I do not work in the trucking industry. I don't know, this is where your domain expertise will be really useful, is to tell us what's going on in the lives of your drivers, what's going on in the, the ebb and flow of the industry that would make people want to search for trucking jobs more here than here. 
I don't know, but you do. I guarantee that you do. But predictive analytics gives you week by week, blow by blow forecasts so that you can time your email and your paid campaigns and your campaign budgets. Spend more when people are looking more. Spend less when people are looking less. In Q3, it's the end of July. And then another spike just after back to school. And in Q4, it's the end of October. And then it's the holidays. Right? This is this coming year. This is not last year. This is this coming year. Have you timed your campaigns? If you've done that, if you do this, you can plan your marketing calendar out for months in advance. Here's another example. When I pulled this chart, CDL jobs near me was the number one term. This is third week of February. Right now, it's trucking jobs near me is the number one term. For people who are trying marketing on social media or on any kind of ad platform or on YouTube, are you focusing on these terms? Are you creating content this week about trucking jobs near me and not about CDL driver jobs? But guess what? In about a, uh, a little further down off of this chart, CDL jobs becomes important. Right? This gives you the ability to make content long in advance so that you're timed and ready to go when the audience is ready to go. You boil it down, you can turn it into a little handout so you can give it to your staff. Hey, here's what the next four weeks look like. Here's what we need to be doing in the next four weeks in order to hit our goals. Right? This week, we should already have content about trucking jobs and truck driver jobs near me. Next week, this was back in January. Next week, we need to have content about Class B. I don't know the difference between Class A and Class B, but people search for very, those very specific things. So do you have recruiting information that's specific to what they're searching for? Plan it in advance. That's what this technology gives you the ability to do. It gives you the ability to see into the future, to understand what's on the minds of your drivers, to decode what's in their heads, Yes, absolutely, ask them questions, talk to them, because you will always get that extra layer of human interaction. But when you have 10,000 drivers or 100,000 drivers, the machines can help lighten that load. Start doing this stuff now. If you don't have the capabilities in your own company, work with an agency that does. Work with a partner company that has those capabilities. I was talking to the folks at Trucker Support this morning. They said they hired a data science firm to analyze what people were saying on their forums. You don't have to become a data scientist or an artificial intelligence expert. You just need to bring in that expertise from time to time to inform your marketing. Why do you need to start now? Remember, machine learning is about machines learning from data. The sooner you start, the sooner you have the data, the more you of a competitive advantage you have over any competitor that has not started now because that's going to take them that much longer to get the data to train the machines. Conversely, if you're late to the game and you've got a competitor who's ahead, it's a much more difficult thing to catch up. How do you get started? Seven-step process. Number one, you need to get your data in order. Right? What data do you have? Is it cataloged? Can you find it anywhere in your company? If HR and marketing are not talking, you have a serious strategic fault. Right? If HR and legal aren't talking, you have a serious strategic problem. Get the people who are involved in the public perception of your company together for beers on Fridays, sharing what they know, what they've learned, so that you can build this strong data foundation. Become data-driven. Last year, it was the last year or the year before, that was the, this was the three Ds, data-driven decisions. Still is. It's on the cover of the page. It's on the tables. But become data-driven. Figure out what your KPIs are and work towards them. By the way, KPIs, key performance indicators, are really easy to find in your company. They are the number that you either get promoted or fired for. That's a KPI. Build research capabilities internally. You will need these whether or not you do machine learning. The ability to run a focus group, the ability to run a survey to your employees is essential. And to do it in a statistically valid way. And the last step for a good number of folks in the room is going to be process automation. What can you do to take away that repetitive stuff so that it frees you up to do more inside in-depth analysis? 
Now, unless you are a trucking company that is building autonomous trucks, chances are the next three steps are the things that you want to look for in an agency partner, in a vendor of some kind. The ability for them to do data science, to explore the unknowns, to have those statistical and mathematical capabilities, coding, engineering, software development. Those are essential for machine learning, but you don't have to have that talent in your company. And also, it's really expensive talent. Your average data scientist salary starts anywhere from three hundred to $750,000 a year. Right? They are very, very expensive. Those of you who are interested in a career change. <laughs> the machine learning capabilities, the ability to create these pieces of software that can learn and eventually to extend artificial intelligence across the enterprise, whether it's internally developed or externally. Do you buy or do you build? The answer is maybe. If you've got time and you don't have money, you can build these capabilities and learn them. It'll take a couple years to learn them. It is, like another, it is another profession. Right? If you have money but you don't have time, you're better off with an agency partner. But most importantly, strategically, if your core competency, maybe it's making boxes for Amazon, maybe it is uh, moving uh, you know, short-range uh, uh, transport, if your core competency doesn't use AI, you probably don't need to build it in-house. You probably just need to find a partner. How do you prepare your career for artificial intelligence? To keep robots from taking your jobs. Number one, you need to have multidisciplinary skills. These are the top 10 skills on LinkedIn right now, as of this year. All of these here. In any one of these categories, there are lots of things that can be automated. And eventually, as machines get smarter, that one thing will get automated away. If you're good at more than one thing, it's very hard to automate. If you're good at sales, and you're good at video, and you're good at analytical reasoning, you are extremely difficult to replace. If you're good at people management, and you can do video, and you can do translation, or maybe make audio production, if you're doing a podcast for your fleet, you're very difficult to replace. By the way, podcasting is one of the, the uh, sneak attacks that you can use to retain drivers and to recruit them. Because what else do drivers do on the road except listen to things? Learn to think algorithmically. Learn to think like a machine. You don't have to become a programmer, but every time you face a problem at work, instead of saying, how do I solve this problem, think, how do I build a system to perpetually solve this problem? And then again, work with partners to build the software so that you can make that problem go away for good instead of solving it once a month, every month, like reporting, for example. Learn to oversee the machines. Machine learning is based on math and the data we give it, which means it is flawed, it is biased. There are things that go into the machine that will come out of the machine if they go in, like bias. The most famous example, uh, three years ago, ProPublica did a study in Florida of a police department that attempted to predict recidivism, the likelihood that somebody would commit another offense. The algorithm was 20% right. You would have been better off flipping a coin. But there was a bias in the data that predicted that African Americans would uh, commit crimes five times more than they actually did. It's totally wrong. Last year, Amazon got into an enormous amount of trouble because they built an algorithm to try and predict which resumes would be the best resumes to hire for. And guess what? It didn't pick women. Why? Because they trained it on data that for the last 10 years, they typically didn't hire women. And if you have a mandate for things like, that are super important, like diversity, what you put in the machine is not what's going to come out for the result that you want. So you need to be a quality checker for the machines for the next few years. Be outcome focused. Your job is to be the chief questions officer at your company. You don't have to build software. The software is building itself. Two years ago, I was trying to learn this deep learning system. And I got a quarter of the way through the chart in nine months, sitting at my desk coding and stuff. Then I went to IBM's event last year, and they said, oh, hey, we made that drag and drop. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> this year, I just got back from IBM's event last week. They're like, oh, that's, that's old news. Now the machine just does it automatically. I'm like, so, so what do I do? Like, you still have to quality check what goes in the machine. It's just the machine's better at making the other machine parts work. Right? So uh, you don't have to become a coder. You do have to be outcome focused. What outcome do we want? What outcome do we care about? Is diversity important? Is keeping... Uh, uh, healthcare costs contained important. What outcomes do you want the machines to do? And look for applications throughout your company. This is a piece of software that we used on this project called Otter. 
uh, like the animal, otter.ai. You give it an audio file and it transcribes it in a text and it does like 600 or 100 hours a month for six bucks a month or something along those lines. If you are dealing with any kind of data that involves things like voice, the machines can help you out significantly. You can transcribe with permission, meetings, phone calls, all these different things as data sources for your machine learning. In the future, there will be two kinds of jobs. Either you will manage the machines or the machines will manage you. That's it. And maybe like sales and entertainment. But that's the future. I will tell you right now, if you manage the machines, that is a much more fulfilling career than the machines managing you. That's where we want to go. If you have questions, we'll take questions. But thank you again to Conversion Interactive for having me. Questions, I believe we have microphones out and around. No? Yes? Gentleman in the orange back there. Good morning. On a scale of one to 10, how important would you say predictive hiring tactics are in the future of recruiting? And if you feel it's pretty high on the scale, will there be a large um, amount, a segment of drivers who will not be willing to participate in predictive hiring tactics? Predictive hiring is a, it's an area, on a scale of one to 10, it's a one now, and it's a 10 soon. And the reason for that is, again, we have a problem with bias, right? Until our software can find and adjust for bias to outcomes that we care about while balancing the business objectives in mind, we won't trust AI to do the right thing. And we shouldn't. Like the Amazon example is a clear case where not hiring women is a stupid thing. They're 51% of the population. If you say, you know, I don't want 51% of potential employees, that's a stupid thing to do, right? But as technology improves, what we are seeing is that software can start to say, you know what, you've got a bias in your data. I'm just going to go ahead and fix it for you. Once those systems become commercially available and in use, then <clears throat> predictive hiring becomes very important because once you are sure that it is fair, that it, is, uh, that it is obeying business outcomes, then you start saying, you know what? We're gonna streamline our hiring pipeline to use this software and just have a human quality check it at the end. It will be a journey to get there. It will be the most important thing you do. Other questions? Right here. Uh, um they say there's no such thing as a dumb question, but this may be the exception to that rule. Um, our business model is one that has, where we basically run 200 private fleets for different customers. Each of those locations has different compensation, freight characteristics, um, home time, and things like that. How do we take all that data and come up with any type of common denominators or, or make sense of something that is that different in its, uh, in its approach? The wonderful thing is you don't have to. The fact that you've got 200 different fleets, if you use software and, and machine learning well means you can maintain, you, the systems can maintain 200 different systems. You don't have to say, we have to have a, 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 an underlying standard. There may not be an underlying standard, and that's okay. In older versions of software, what typically happened was they tried to find a one size fits all, and what we find out that one size fits almost nobody, right? When you use, AI to build custom models. You're going to have a model. You may have a model for drivers only within Boston, right? You may have a model for drivers only within Dallas. Those are two totally different models. Cost of living is different. Fuel costs are different. Weather is different. And so when you start deploying those models in production for things like predictive hiring or for just simple efficiencies like what's working, the Boston model will sit on its own and will keep tuning itself based on what Boston data there is. You, if you're working with a, a data science team, they'll probably do what's called perturbation testing, which is saying we're gonna insert some randomness just to see if, you know, we'll take 5% of the data from Dallas and put it in Boston just to see what happens. But the machine will eventually correct it back down to saying, yep, this is what 
Boston drivers care about, and therefore this is what the things you should be doing in the Boston market are. Where you'll run into trouble with that is not the modeling, it was actually be the, what you do with it, because you may not be able to scale your own, the rest of your business to have 200 separate models, but the machines themselves will be able to keep those differences and, and help you understand each individual micro market better. Eventually in marketing, we're gonna get rid of customer segments, right? Because a machine scaled appropriately can have a true one-on-one -on -one relationship with your customer, right? It know, it, we see this already in things like Facebook. Facebook knows that what you like is different than what you like, that it's different than what you like, and it maintains them all separately. Your news feed's gonna look different than your news feed because the machines can do that. It's across the board with, in all of our companies, we will get to a point where our interactions will truly be one-to-one, -one, even if we as humans can't scale that, even if we can't remember who in the world this person is, the machines will. Right here, in the red, and then, was there one over there? Is it possible when you're looking at what drivers are talking about, what they want, that we have a bias introduced by what they think they should be saying to get a job rather than actually saying what they want, and how do you account for that? There is absolutely a bias. There's a bias in every single data set. When you look at Reddit, for example, Reddit skews male and younger. When you look at uh, Pinterest, Pinterest scales older and female. So understanding the bias of each data set is important to being able to put together that common language. And to your point, yes, a, a driver on the phone with or face to face with a recruiter is going to say very different things than when he's at the, the truck stop talking to his friend. Do you want to account for that bias? Yes, but more importantly, you want to be able to understand can, is there some things that they won't say to our faces that we can proactively start the conversation with them and lead with it that immediately develops that empathy and that rapport with the driver that says, hey, I understand, yes, pay is important, got it, that's easy, right? But maybe there's a segment of your drivers that are Jewish, and they're like, hey, we want to be home for the holidays too. Guess what? We got different holidays. And, and no one's talking to us about that. Right? So there's, there is absolutely bias. Use it to understand the audiences or the same audience within different contexts, and then use that data to change the relationship you have with the drivers. Other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for, for having me. Want help solving your company's data, analytics, and digital marketing problems? Visit trustinsights.ai today and let us know how we can help you.